Hello, good to see you. Pastor Sam with a devotion for March 4th. If you tuned in for our devotion on uh, the 2nd on Tuesday, there was none. I was out sick earlier this week. Um, not like bad sick, but just enough that I should be not around other human beings. And I'm recording this in the solitude of my office. So I'm feeling better, not all the way, but feeling better. So thank you for all of you who have prayed for me. I appreciate it. We are going to be kind of starting to ramp down in our look at Job. We've got today and then two more sessions where we're going to talk about Job. We, we kind of missed Tuesday. We're going to sort of talk about it today. Anyway, today Job's fourth friend is going to speak and he speaks on God's behalf in a correct manner. Next time, God is going to talk and kind of tell Job how it is. And then in our last time, which will be next Tuesday, Job is going to talk and we'll kind of have the resolution of this whole chronicle. That's where we're going. Now, today's probably going to be a little bit shorter. I'm, I'm doing all right, but not great. So I don't have so many words in me, um, but we'll kind of see what it is. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Job 36, 1 through 21. And Elihu continued and said, Bear with me a little, and I will show you, for I have yet something to say on God's behalf. I will get my knowledge from afar, and ascribe righteousness to my Maker. For truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. Behold, God is mighty, and does not despise any. He is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their right. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but with kings on the throne he sets them forever, and they are exalted. And if they are bound in chains and caught in the cords of affliction, then he declares to them their work and their transgressions that they are behaving arrogantly. He opens their ears to instruction and commands that they return from iniquity. If they listen and serve him, they complete their days in prosperity and their years in pleasantness. But if they do not listen, they perish by the sword and die without knowledge. The godless in heart cherish anger they do not cry for help when he binds them. They die in youth, and their life ends among the cult prostitutes. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction, and opens their ear by adversity. He has allured you out of distress, into a broad place where there was no cramping, and what was set on your table was full of fatness. But you are full of the judgment on the wicked. Judgment and justice seize you. Beware lest wrath entice you into scoffing, and let not the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. Will your cry for help avail to keep you from distress, or all the force of your strength? Do not long for the night, when peoples vanish in their place. Take care, do not turn to iniquity, for this you have chosen, rather than affliction. There's two kind of things that Elihu is talking about, especially in chapter 36 here, and kind of more generally in his speech to Job. First of all, God is in the right. We have to start with that position, and that's really where Elihu is trying to pull Job back. God is in the right. Secondly, uh, because of God being in the right, don't you, Job, go to, uh, don't you try to be God? I'll, I'll say a little bit more, and then I'll say plenty more about that. Um, that we have this kind of lure, temptation, I suppose I'll call it, in when, when we are suffering, to kind of look out at other people and be like, wow, that person deserves to suffer a lot more than I am, but they're not. So I guess God is wrong. It is it's kind of where that leads. You don't add that last bit, but that's that's really the conclusion of that that sort of uh, judgment. I'm suffering, and I know that I'm a good person, whatever that means. Um, and that person over there, who I know is a much worse person than I am, is suffering less. 
So there, therefore, the scales of justice are imbalanced and God must be in the wrong. That's the temptation we have as we're suffering is, again, to look outward, not at God, which would be a good place to look, but to look kind of inward first and, and like ascribe our suffering level and then compare that to, to the perceived suffering level of other people. And, and of course, we always find someone where it's imbalanced. There's some much worse person who's suffering not as badly as us. We can always, it, it seems so easy to call that to mind. And Elihu is like, whoa, slow down, Job. Uh, we have to start with the idea that God is right. And so any, any thought, any train of thought that leads us to an opposite conclusion must be wrong. If you look out and see, oh, that bad person, whatever that means, is suffering not so badly as I am, therefore God is unjust. Okay, that leads us to a wrong conclusion that must be false somewhere along the line. Has to be false somewhere since it leads us to actually the opposite conclusion of where we must start with. All right, and the other thing that Elihu is doing is, is asserting God's rightness and justice and presenting right answers. Um, right possibilities, I'll say, to the problem of suffering. The, the trouble in these answers is that God, quite frankly, hasn't, at least in my experience, hasn't told me why I'm having a particular suffering, why I get sick. And so really the best that we can do is kind of guess. Here are some possible guesses that lead us to a good place. You won't be able to point your finger at any one and be like, oh, this is the reason. Because again, God is going to answer next time and kind of tell us, you need to let me do my work and, and I'm very good at my work. And I'm not going to tell you why or how I'm doing my work. It, it's, there we go. I spoiled next time's uh, devotion. But um, where is it? Okay, so here's one of the uh, things. Uh, so kind of in, it's, it's in verses 8 through 12, is this idea of God may use suffering as a call to repentance. Right? Elihu is using the example, think about a king. If the king is behaving arrogantly, in his words, God will use, God can use suffering to call him to stop and to reflect upon his actions and realize that he's going down a bad path. And Elihu says, if he listens, then blessing. If he listens to God and, and walks in the path of God, blessing. If he doesn't, if he continues down the path of uh, foolishness, then death. <laughs> well, very different consequences. Now, again, we can't say with any degree of certainty why God is doing a suffering, why God is, is causing us to have a suffering. We can't. That's, God will talk about that next time. We just can't. So these are possibilities. Um, again, not that I want you to, to try to point to, all right, well, there's 40% chance it's this one and 20% chance and, you know, to run the odds and come up with the most, that's not the point. The point is all of these possibilities, again, cause us to reflect upon God being in control and God, again, doing things that benefit us. So consider, consider this possibility. God can use suffering to, to slow us down on a bad path and to redirect us to a good one. Okay, that's, that's like a, a good thing for us, to be not walking down this bad path and to instead be walking down this good path. That's a good thing. Now, God uses a bad, again, whatever that means, thing to do it. But Elihu even talks about that. And hopefully I can... Okay, verse 15. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction and opens their ear by adversity. Now notice, and this is very, very important, it does not say 
He delivers the afflicted from their affliction and opens their ears from adverse. It does not say that, okay? So there's not this idea of escaping suffering. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction. In suffering, you are forced, well, you're not forced to, you, you ought to rely on God. In suffering, you are confronted with the limitations of your own control and power and ability, and hopefully, you trust in God. That's, uh, again, we don't have a, a reason for suffering. God's going to say that next time. But that's one of the pos one, one of the strongest um, threads running through suffering, that you can't do X. God is already working through X. So go with, go with him on this, is, is kind of the long and the short of suffering. Now, again, that's a great answer because God's known all along how he wants you to walk down the path of life. God's with you every step, blessing you, bringing good out of suffering, bringing blessings out of suffering. But he doesn't like swoop you away and, and put you on like the suffering free road. Um, the way of Christ is the way of suffering is during Lent, well, all the time, but especially during Lent, is the way of the cross. God is a suffering God. Jesus is a suffering God. Now, we, again, we can see in the suffering of Jesus, God gives us great blessing, forgiveness of sins, the promise of eternal life, and salvation with him forever. Those are really, really good things. But God doesn't swoop Jesus out of suffering. He doesn't like reach down and grab him off the cross and do some kind of really big, glamorous, dramatic whatever. He lets Jesus die and then raises him from the dead, which we ought not to forget. The, the raising from the dead is, is the really important thing. That's like the whole eternal life. <laughs> Again, he delivers the afflicted by their affliction. God is with you in suffering. Now, I'm using very careful words. I'm not saying that he works through suffering. What we don't want to use, what we don't want to do is try to look through our suffering and be like, oh, God is doing this. You know, I, I got sick so that I could whatever. You know what? Complete that statement. We don't, we don't want to try to see through and to look and see what God's doing because there's there's stuff behind the curtain, kind of Wizard of Oz reference, but but you should not peer behind the curtain. Like, you can't peer behind the curtain. And any answer, God is doing the suffering because any answer that you say with certainty is, is out and out wrong. You can't with certainty say any of these answers. You can say, he might be doing it to cause repentance, and you can reflect upon your life and probably come up with something that you were doing wrongly that you need to do better on. That That's just like a general thing, whether you're suffering or not. There's always something that we're doing wrong that we need to do better on. God may be doing it to cause you to trust him more. There's never a point where you have trusted God fully, like you can't get more trust in him. And you're like, all right, I guess I'm as trusting full as I can. No, you can always trust God more. God may want to display his power in your life or his whatever, whatever attribute you may want to display his God, Godhood. Uh, again, all of these things God may be doing, but we can't ever pin down exactly what he is doing. We just have to trust. And, and, and that's kind of the linchpin of Elihu's two points. God is right. So Job, so you friend, trust him. Because if you don't, one of the one of the roads that you tend to go down is this kind of self-justifying. And that's where Elihu points at the end. And he says, um, okay, his the last verse that we read. Take care, do not turn to iniquity, for this you have chosen rather than affliction. And as we've seen Job go through the book, as he's been listening to to his um what did I use? Worthless physicians giving wrong answers to, to the problem of suffering. 
he's he's been sort of turning more and more inward and trying to self-justify, which is always a bad thing. Because for one thing, it never works. Um, and for two, it, it brings your eyes down off of God and from trusting in God and being like very selfish conclusions. I don't deserve to have this suffering. Um, it is kind of the long and the short of it. Like that person over there deserves to have it much worse than I do, but they're not. So therefore God is unjust, right? It leads us to all kinds of terrible conclusions when we turn inward. And Elihu is cautioning Job. Job, you started, I'm, I'm saying this, Elihu doesn't say this directly. Job, you started in a really good place. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There we go. That's our response to suffering. Um, but over the course of listening to these worthless friends, worthless physicians, even though Job kind of refutes them, he's still sort of digesting their words and 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 kind of keeping some of their words because he turns from, blessed be the name of the Lord, to why God are you doing this? I, I'm, I'm in the right more or less to some degree. I don't deserve what's going on. Now God's going to answer him next time like I said, and I kind of want to leave that for next time. But again, we start with the position of God is in the right and and we allow God to justify us, which he does in Jesus, um, and, and which he will do ultimately in the resurrection. That will be the final uh, wiping suffering off the board, restoring us, making us not suffering people in the resurrection. That's That's when he will do it. And perhaps at certain points now, he may, to varying degrees. But, um, I suppose I'll say it, but you'll die. Regardless of any relief he gives you now, you're still going to die, which which is a suffering. So you've got that, like, hang, hanging out, get my hand in the frame, hanging over your head. No matter, no matter what relief and blessings God gives you now, you're still going to die. But even that suffering God already God already told you how he's going to answer in the resurrection. So, he's a just God and a right God and a good God and a holy God and all those all those positive adjectives. God. Trust him. There we go. That that's again, we've kind of said that throughout the book of Job. That's really the response to suffering. Just trust God. Trust God. Next time God is going to talk and he'll more God, God is going to be very upset with Job. Um, it's not humorous, but it's one of those like, oh, dang, I'm glad I'm not Job. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll have some kind of um, upset words from God next time. But we'll get to that, like I said, next time. So let's pray. Dear Lord God, when we are in the midst of suffering, help us to turn our eyes toward you and to trust in you working however you will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with me. Um, we'll kind of be back to our regular scheduled programming, I think, unless, unless God does a suffering and I get super duper sick, but we'll see. E either way, I'll trust God. Um, thank you for being here. I really do appreciate it. If you would, I would also appreciate if you leave a comment, something I said that was helpful or something that was uh, confusing or something that you disagreed with. That's fine too. You're you're welcome to um, express all of those feelings. If you give a like, share it with somebody. Those are great ways. It helps the YouTubes to know that this is a good video and it kind of like promotes it then. So even even doing the thumbs up helps to share this with other people crazy how the world works. Um, so anyway, I'll see you next time and God's peace be with you.